So I would say that probably spatial environments and uh, network-based environments probably make up, you know, well over half, if not, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the age-based models that I see out there. But there are some age-based models that have been done in other types of environments that I think are very interesting. And so one of them I want to talk about is the 3D environment. And there is a separate package called NetLogo 3D that allows you to actually build uh, three-dimensional uh, models. And What's interesting about this is not only when you think about a 3D environment, you have some interesting things that you have to consider as you're constructing your model. So obviously you have X, Y, and now Z to think about, right? But you also have to think about that heading is no longer the only description of an agent, right? They have heading, they have pitch, and they even have yaw, right? And so you have to consider those as well. Uh, so one of my favorite 3D models, I think, makes a point very quickly. It doesn't use the pitch and yaw. It actually just uses this as kind of like a 3D grid. Uh, but that's the sand pile model. And I'll, uh, give you, I'll show you that real quickly. Okay, so here we have the NetLogo 3D model. And by the way, I just want to remind you, you have to actually open a different application than NetLogo. It came with NetLogo. It was in the same folder, uh, but it's called NetLogo 3D, right? Um, and so I've pulled up the sand pile model. And actually, by the way, it also, in 3D, the, the, the world view is a separate window. There isn't a way to build it into the same window very easily, so that hasn't been done. Um, and so we're going to hit setup first, and that's actually gonna change our view on this world. And then we're gonna hit go once. And what go once does is it drops a random particulate of sand onto the model. And the sand pile model is a great model. It was built by uh, Pearbach originally. Um, and what it basically did was make the argument that you could have these interesting interactions. So um, if we let it run for a while, the sand is going to build up. And then over time, you're going to see sand particulates that start to pile up on top of each other. And if they get more than four particulates, then the next one causes them to fall down. right? And so all four go off to the next one. Well, what's interesting is if their four neighbors also have four particulates of sand, right, then they actually also uh, collapse. And this is called an avalanche, right? And you have these avalanches. And so you can record what the size of an avalanche is from any one particular patch. And so now we're seeing so there was an avalanche that caused quite a few, right, to happen. There it caused a couple. And what Pear Box showed, right, was that the the number of avalanches that occurred, the size of the avalanches that occurred, had this nice power law um, uh, um, property to it. And he called this particular idea that the, you, certain systems move to a state of being in a power law, he called that self-organized criticality, that they reach a state uh, where they are in this uh, critical space where new particles continue to add to this power law distribution over time. By the way, um, so in the NetLogo model, right, this is the 3D version. It's nice because you could spin it around, look at it in different examples, things like that, right? Um, and I think, you know, it's very obvious in the 3D model what's going on a lot of times. So as I was saying, it's very obvious what's happening in the 3D model with the particles dropping and you can see the actual interactions, right? This is the exact same pair box sand pile model, but now running in 2D as opposed to 3D. And yeah, you know, the numbers are the same. You can see the same, you know, uh, patterns of behavior. But personally, I just find this a lot less compelling of a visualization and a lot less uh, interesting uh, in, to find out what's going on. Like it's, it's less intuitive than the 3D model where you see exactly what's going on within the system, right? Uh, so it's another argument as to why you should think carefully about what environment you're using uh, when you're building up your agent-based models. Now besides 3D environments, you also have GIS-based environments. And these are environments in which the data that the agents are going to be acting on is drawn directly from real data that we have about the world around us, right? Uh, and there's, a, there's actually a great little GIS extension that exists in NetLogo that helps you do this and helps it make it very easy for you to bring in GIS data. Uh, so I'm going to show you there's a model called GIS General Examples, and so we're going we're gonna to talk through, talk through that in a little bit. Okay, so as promised, here's the GIS General Examples uh, model in NetLogo. And as you can see, it uses the extension of GIS. It also uses a bunch of data that is embedded in here. 
Um, and these are all basically um, shape files uh, from a GIS data sets, right? Uh, and it's the cities, the rivers, countries, world elevation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in this particular case, for instance, what this allows us to do is we can now display like the major cities that exist in the world, for instance, right? Um, and we can display, and we can turn on the labels, right? If we hit display, and you can actually see these cities um, as to where they are and what cities they are. Uh, we can display the rivers. Let's turn off display the cities labels, right? Um, sorry, display the, the labels at least, right? Um, and you can see the major rivers. Um, we could label the rivers obviously as well. Um, we can display country boundaries, right? Um, and so forth. And we, in this case, we're actually doing this all as line drawings. So with GIS data, you can either do it as line drawings where it's just a, a drawing on top of it, but drawings can't really be interacted with very easily. So a lot of times it makes sense uh, to actually have the, the, um, the GIS data be read into patches instead. So for instance, we could display the rivers in patches, right, by reading them in in that way. Um, and this allows us different access uh, allows us now to interact with those patches so we could have an agent moving around in North America who runs into a particular space. Now this model is done at a very zoomed out level, right? But you could take a set of this data and look at it at a much closer level within the model. Um, and in fact, let me give you one other example where we, so this one is mainly just displaying. Let me give you one where we actually have agents running on top of this. So here we have the NetLogo Grand Canyon model, right? Um, and if you look at the code, by the way, we're not actually using the GIS extension, though we could. What it does actually is read in data uh, from this data file and then set the patch elevations to that data, right? So it actually um, is reading what's called a digital elevation map, where it actually is uh, bringing in the data directly from a file and it's setting this value called elevation to whatever that value is. By the way, this is done in the startup procedure, which we haven't talked about before, but startup is actually a special uh, procedure in NetLogo. If NetLogo sees that you have a startup procedure, it actually runs it right when the model loads rather uh, than uh, when the model is set up, right? Um, and so this can, have, um, this can have the ability to add uh, to, to do things before you run the setup command, right? And so you see it actually does two startup and then the setup is the last thing it does, right? Um, and so, in fact, when you load this model, it already comes as, uh, as you see it with the display already there, right? So now um, we can hit setup, of course, and we can hit go. And what this is doing is it's now allowing us to observe the interaction of agents with the GIS data because what it's doing is it's dropping raindrops down on top of the, the, the Grand Canyon and then seeing where they flow, right? And it does that by dropping an agent represented by a raindrop and then calculating where is the next lowest patch it should go to and then moving down. And of course you get some that get stuck, right? These are like little pools, you can think of them almost, right? Uh, but the vast majority of them flow down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, which is where the Colorado River is. So that's an example of how you can actually interact with GIS data in um, an agent-based model.